Hello, my friends, and welcome to your Friday. If you're listening on Friday, this is Stand Up with Pete Dominic Daly, the pared down version, the Friday show. No news, just guests, two great guests joining me on today's program. Christian Finnegan, of course, because he joins me pretty much every Friday for hashtag Finnegan Fridays. And guess who's back? It's Dr. Jason Johnson. You know him from MSNBC. He's got his own Slate podcast now, which is the reason why he hasn't been joining me on mine, because he was exclusive, I guess. I don't know what changed, but he said he can now join me again. And so I immediately asked him, how about tomorrow? And we talked. Two great conversations on today's program. Thank you very much for supporting it, for listening to it, for sharing it. Had a great conversation last night at our hangout. We usually do it on Thursdays, but we did it on Wednesday. So, uh, and I'm recording this now on Thursday. Anyway, had a great hangout. We talked a lot about coming back out of the pandemic and returning to normal. Obviously, people had different perspectives on it. I've been struggling with it. And I just wanted to say that up front. Don't want to talk a lot before I get to my guests, but I've definitely been struggling with it. I really thrived during the pandemic. The podcast took off. I went to daily episodes, transitioning out of corporate media and Sirius XM into independent media and taping from a shed every day, which I'm loving. I'm loving all of this, but it's been great during the pandemic. And now I'm, I'm, I'm worried that it's not going to be as well or as much or it's not going to be as special. And I'm also just feeling the already the, the FOMO of things I may or may not be involved with, you know. So I wonder if you're like me or not, and I definitely want to keep having that conversation with you and with my guests. I would love to hear how you're dealing. We had a great talk with listeners uh, at the Hangout, and you can join us every week. We'll do it again next Wednesday, normally Thursday, but these two weeks, it's Wednesday because I'm taking long weekends. And so we'll continue to have that conversation. And I definitely want to hear from you. So email me, standupwithpete at gmail.com, the question of the week. How you doing as things return to, quote, normal or what words are you using to to talk about how this, this change in our society is occurring? Well, I hope you're doing well. I appreciate you listening and supporting. If you're not already, sign up for a paid subscription right now. Go to the paid subscription link in the show notes. But let's get it started, shall we? That's why you're here for the guest interviews, I'm sure. Christian Finnegan, Jason Johnson coming up. But first, comedian Christian Finnegan joins me as he does every Friday to ostensibly go over the week. But uh, we always end up talking about all kinds of different things. He just had open heart surgery. So last week's episode, we talked all about that. He's two weeks out since that concluded. And uh, we had a great conversation about a whole bunch of things that are going on in the news and uh, a few laughs as well, as we always do. He's on Twitter, at Christ Finnegan, where he's great. You should buy his stand-up specials. And you mentioned there are a couple of those little Zoom blips, you know, where the sound goes out. Nothing too bad. I don't think we lose too much. But sorry about that. You're always trying to do better with a local recording. But I rarely have problems when we're talking. Anyway, here it is, Christian Finnegan, right now. Okay. There he is, Christian Finnegan, Finnegan Fridays. Last week, we talked all about your health, your recovery from open heart surgery. In case anybody didn't join us, it was a fascinating co- uh, conversation. A lot of people really appreciated how open you were. How are you feeling a week later? Incrementally better? A lot better? Oh, God. Uh, uh, I feel no. fine. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> just died. Just got a flat I mean, no. Honestly, though, I am a little exhausted today because I'm at that point in my recovery where i am doing things i was told not to do you you know where i feel like i can like i feel normal until i do a bunch of stuff and then i'm like oh right i can't do that or that it takes a lot out of me like just i was out weeding earlier today and just you know bending over standing up all of a sudden you get really headed you know whatever but it's all it's all fine it just it just feels like i'm operating at half capacity and uh, and then also like any time I lift something I'm not supposed to lift, it's like oh right, big hole in chest. Must be aware of that. And emotionally, how are you doing? Well, I will say that that sort of high I had, I think I discussed it when I was last week. You that sort it, of right? you know, life is beautiful feeling I had has uh, ebbed slightly. And but I said I wasn't going to punish myself for that, and I'm trying not to. Like I, it, you know, real life will flood back in and so i will just uh cherish it as a a couple of weeks of irrational exuberance and uh and try to <laughs> deal with the fact that things feel poopy again but you know when will you get back on stage 
I think that I probably will maybe next weekend. I think I was told six weeks next week will be four. Uh, I think that will be fine. It'll be four and a half by next weekend. Well, I'm very glad that uh, you're feeling better in many ways, yeah. but I appreciate it. I just, I would, wor- I would worry that like towards the end of my set, I might start to get a little dizzy, you know, cause I tend to push vocally and things like that. And, uh, I would rather not, uh, have an incident. Do you, I don't know how you get what your range emotionally is necessarily actually, but, but like, do you, have you tried to control like getting really upset or worked up or as they say, getting your blood pressure up during this time? Cause it wouldn't be great because we should always be working on that regardless of if you had surgery, I have a hard time controlling my emotions and reactions, especially like, like when I get really angry and frustrated and impulsive, but is that something that you're thinking more about or not? Not it, it is, but it, 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 sometimes it has a, you know, um, it has the, the opposite of the desired effect in the sense that it just makes me more upset. And, you know, like, don't be angry, stop being angry. You know, it doesn't, uh, that's not a calming, <laughs> uh, 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 approach to, uh, you know, hedging your emotions. Um, I am trying to avoid situations like that, but I would not have it. Um, all right. Well, there's a few things, of course, that I want to talk with you about this week. We kind of uh, pretend that we're going to, I probably pretend that we're going to cover what happened this week. Every time I talk to you at the end of the week, sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. We, we did for a long time. And then it just kind of became like two middle-aged dudes uh, revealing themselves to each other. And that yeah. sounds weird. But uh, in, a, in a highway rest stop, uh, no, um, uh, and that's fine too. But yes, no, we, the things are going on in the world, Peter, and, and we should discuss them. So there are three kind of stories to tie together. You just mentioned one before I hit record that I'm not familiar with, but, uh, that are, that are somewhat similar. And that is prominent people uh, using words that we are retiring, uh, the N word, the F word for the gays. Uh, and so you've got Hunter Biden texts coming out where he was using the N word. You've got, of course, this happened earlier or this year. This country music star was yelling the N word, and 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 he ended up selling more albums. Uh, you also have apparently Kid Rock. You were telling me yelling the mm-hmm. F word, and then finally and doubling like, down on it on Twitter today. Oh, really? Oh, I want to hear about mm-hmm. the, you. Tell me what happened there. But but then also uh, this guy that we know from our industry, the comedy industry, and just for last comedy festival, a guy named Jeff Singer, uh, getting called out for using the N word kind of casually in conversation around a table. And so you can, they're all different, obviously, but they're also similar in that people are getting in trouble and either they're doubling down and not apologizing or they're saying, I, they roll the apology podium out. What are your, what are your thoughts on all of these similarities and the differences and what did Kid Rock say? Oh, Kid Rock was being filmed at a place called the Fish Lips Bar and Grill in uh, Smithville, Tennessee. I'm not exactly sure who's doing uh, Kid Rock's booking these days. It's a five-time Grammy Award winner, but he's performing at the Fish Lips with a Z, Fish Lips oh. uh, Bar and Grill. And cool. um, cool saw books. people filming him with their iPhones and called them F-words. Uh, and, it re- you know, the whole... It, it, it's typical with these social media things. It's not as if he released a a speech, you know, where he, you know, and now I will say this slur. You know, it's him being an idiot at a bar and calling people who are filming things on their cell phones, F words. And, um, and then, so that got filmed and that made the rounds on TMZ and things like that. And then today, today, of course he had to, he hedged in the sort of corniest, most cowardly way possible. He's like, if you're offended by me saying the F word, that means you probably are one. Meanwhile, I'm going to go check in with my gay friends. Cause I'm cool with them. And it's just like, dude, Stand by it or don't, you know, don't just don't try to separate that word. Like, oh, no, I'm not talking about gay people when I say that. And, dude, come on. Stop it. Kid Rock doubles down on homophobic slur. Kid Rock is caught on video using a homophobic slur. Kid Rock repeats homophobic slur in response to video. Hmm. It, well, it's just, well, I mean, as you know, it's like there used to be something called a monoculture. And if you wanted to be successful as a musician or an actor or, uh, you know, any sort of uh, performing artist, you, you wanted to appeal to the most broad based 
group of human beings and there were sort of gatekeepers in place to sort of you had uh, you had to sort of be a certain way whether you're a country star heavy metal star there were sort of guardrails about what you could say and what you couldn't say well now with the internet everything is fractured and splintered and there's no monoculture and so there's these smaller little subcultures and now there's this weird kind of douchebag economy that you have you have this a uh, group of people that the anti woke brigade, the people who just want, you know, they, they, they'll, whatever musician will say the N word or the F word or, you know, give it to the libtards or whatever. That's, that's now my, I identify with that group of people. And so I think that people, you know, you think that p- progress is being made, but in many ways, people are doubling down on kind of far right or just what we would consider sort of a Neanderthal uh, culture. Yeah. Um, you know, the kind of kind of crap that we thought that we had left in the dust in the eighties. People are kind of doubling down on that because for a core group of audience, for a small audience, that's what they want to hear. You know, so kid rock would, would have been on his best behavior 10 years ago, playing with Cheryl Crow at the Grammys or whatever. Uh, and he's kind of would try to appeal more as kind of the kinder, you know, but now it, for Kid Rock to sort of, you know, appeal to any demographic at this point, he almost has to become more retrograde. If that if that makes sense or he's leaning yeah. into it. That's a really great nuanced explanation of kind of where we have come. And, and I guess it, dif- it matters who we're talking about. I mean, you can wear blackface and remain the governor of Virginia. So he got through that. Andrew Cuomo got through all of his stuff uh, for you know, we can talk about the different reasons why. And Kid Rock is who he is. And it seems like there's kind of been a devolution of culture or uh, uh, just siloing off or. Yeah, it's just it's just strange because it's like you know, it used to be that if you wanted to hear someone yelling homophobic slurs, you'd have to be in Kid Rock's audience. But uh, <laughs> now you have to hear it just straight from the stage. Or you'd have to be. Uh, let me just take it to the next conversation at the insurrection. I mean, I keep seeing these black cops that were there that day, Capitol Hill police, DC police saying they were calling me the N word. Like all of them are yeah. saying that. And it's, it, it's just interesting because that insurrection, you know, we can equate Trumpers to white supremacists pretty accurately. That doesn't mean every one of them uses the N word, but if, if that's your threshold for racism, which unfortunately it is for a lot of people, well, it's not like I say racist things, Well, they were, they were calling the black ops, the N word, a lot well, of because, them. Because there's this intoxicating, you know, uh, freedom that I think people probably felt in that situation. They're surrounded by like-minded people and all of a sudden the guardrails are gone. Like the, the idea that you're going to be judged and not only can, can you get away with saying that there's a, there's a charge and there's going to be some support and backup. It's like, you're saying the thing that people are saying we can't say, you know what I mean? That there's kind of, it's kind of almost, I bet in some way it feels brave to them to do that. Like, uh, the shackles are off and I'm going to say that word that you say I can't say. That's how, uh, you know, that's they're They're on the offense in the, in that context. Yeah. Yeah. Does that make we, sense? Yeah, it absolutely does. But I'm just as you think about as you say that, I'm just thinking about I'm going to say the thing that we can't say. And, and I was thinking, well, you can say it. That's the point. Right. You can say what you want. There used to be more consequences for it but you just laid out a couple of examples we didn't really get into the the biden thing i'm not sure what the consequences should be for hunter biden much less joe biden and his son texted those things we've seen those texts but what about the difference between the fact that there used to be consequences if you said those things more openly in public now everybody is filming each other or themselves or your private conversations are coming out now so i'm getting together obviously his the, the hunter biden thing it's like obviously those are straight up stolen texts, which I feel like is one of the reasons that people are kind of holding back on commenting on it too much because it's, it's straight up theft. It's not like guy, he was out in pub, all these things. And, you know, it, it, there also was the fact that it's, it's as, as offensive as it is. It's also just super corny. It's some dude who is probably, you know, clearly had issues with illegal substances, you know, using N word, like, you know, uh, in a sort of colloquial, colloquial way to like, you know, my nigga, you know, talk about his, uh, you know, his lawyer that that somehow was like a complimentary thing. And so, of course, it's ridiculous. Of course, it's offensive. But 
Hunter Biden is not an elected official and he is not a part of the campaign. People are like, oh, if Don Jr. had said this, there'd be a big uproar. Well, of course there would, because Don Jr. was on Fox News every day as a as a campaign uh, uh, adjunct. You know, the, the, the Trump children were out front as faces of the Trump administration every day in every way. You know, we, we do separate the sins of the father from the sins of the son, so long as the son is not there giving press conferences, you, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So long as the son is not the secretary of the interior. I mean, they yeah. were basically working for certainly Ivanka uh, and Jared, who is equivalent to his son, because his family was working. Yes, the, they're, the you know, constantly in the campaign. Yes, wh- whether they were officially uh obviously they were never getting they would never get confirmed they were never going to be senate uh confirmed positions but they were out front as pr adjuncts for the the trump campaign and so yes the standards are different i'm sorry they just are whereas you know if i'm sure as much as joe biden loves his son if he could stick him in a in a drawer for four years i'm (laughs) sure he would and you that's know, I mean, true of almost every politician and a relative of, of theirs, yeah. a brother, you know, Bill Clinton's brother, Hillary Clinton's brothers. I mean, you name it. There were always yes. kids, of course. It's uh, Tommy it's Boy. You know, it's, yeah. It's, uh, well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I think that's a fair uh, look at it. An explanation of that. All right. We go from language and the insurrection to I wanted to just ask you what you thought. I just want to throw the, the two, these two words out there to get Christian Finnegan's reactions. And those two words are Joe and Manchin. Oh, gosh. You know, you got anything? I, th- I think you it's thought? well, I mean, yep. t- to me, the answer, if to the extent that there is an answer, is that 50 isn't going to be good enough to Fill get about shit done. Yeah. You know, yeah, I mean, that that mansion has decided that he's going to be a drama queen and that he and even I don't know if that's a inappropriate way to phrase it, that that makes some implication. Or, there's not there's not a word for a male <laughs> drama queen that doesn't sound vaguely like a homophobic epithet. But uh, I'll he's decided that, yeah. bro, but he's going to center himself as Mr. Important and. The truth of the matter is, is that the institution of the Senate in his mind and his idea about kind of holding the appearance of bipartisanship is more important than democracy. It's more important. Like his image of bipartisan cooperation is more important than voting rights. It's more important than, you know, than people's lives, quite frankly. That, that he rather be the star of the show than have any of these things that might help his actual constituents. That That's my take on it. Yeah, I think that's a, a good take. But one of the things I just thought that was interesting, he met with the, all the civil rights leaders, uh, all of them, a bunch of civil, civil rights <laughs> leaders. And um, all of talk, them? Wow, they got all of them. That's amazing. You know, all together. And uh, to try to convince him, you know, to vote for these two bills that will prevent suppression of black folks voting. And and he came away and he's like, basically diplomatic is like, I appreciate it. I haven't changed my mind. And what I think a lot of times Christian is if a bunch of, you know, smart women that I respected sat me down and said, P you got to stop with this or black people or gay people or Jewish people. And they said, P you know, you really could should change the trajectory of, of, of your program to stop doing this or start doing this or in your own personal life. If I met with those, like I, the idea of not hearing them, the idea of not changing to me, I know it's politics and a lot of it is what you just said, but like that kind of arrogance. And this is true of all people. Like if all of the black people, if all of the gay people, Jewish people are saying you're being a dick, you're being offensive. I don't like your behavior. And you say too bad. I'm right. You're wrong. What does that make you? What does that say about you? How do people stay strong in, in the face of all of that evidence from the aggrieved group well, of people? That's- that's a meeting. It's it's a it's a 40 minute meeting in his office on his home turf with people he will never see again. You know, they, there's it, it's it, the, the politicians have mastered. It. You don't get to be at a, a place where Joe Manchin is. And this is a, true of every politician. I mean, he was the governor of a state. He's been a senator for a long time. You don't get to a position like that without being able to look in people's face and nod and look sympathetic and then do the opposite once they leave, <laughs> you know, you, you've, you've mastered that ability. Yeah. And um, to, to me, the only way forward and it's, it's, I'm smarter people than me say it's impossible, but 
is to render him irrelevant by trying to widen the, uh, you know, to get more than 50 votes in the Senate in, in, in the midterms, which obviously people talk about how the midterms, the administration always loses uh, seats. But I think if I recall, I, I think the map in 2022 is is not unfavorable to Democrats. Um, and I feel like the rules could be different this time. I feel like the the Trump administration was so chaotic and so many people just wanted the drama to stop. So many people just were sick of the bullshit. And a lot of what the current Republican Senate and Republican House members represent is a return to chaos. You know, I think that there is an argument to be made, a national argument. I don't know how to play an individual races, but I think there's a national argument to be made is remember how crazy shit was before 2020. If you let the Republicans get the House or the Senate, it's a return to craziness. And I, I, I hope that that would be a convincing argument to a lot of people. I don't think that there's a lot of people who voted for Biden who are going to all of a sudden be like, you know what? I feel like the Republicans should get a shot now. It's only been two years. I just don't think it's 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 in, it's not in the rear view enough that the, the 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 transition from Bush to Obama was pretty clean cut. The transition was very clean cut. And so and then then Obamacare happened, which really turned a lot of people against Obama. Yep. I feel like the, the stench of Trump is still in the room. And I, I hope that that means that people who are turned off by it in 2020 will still feel turned off by it in 2022. We'll see. But that's I, what I hope. I think that's good analysis and I tend to uh, agree with it. But then I always look at their arguments and one of the most effective argument and we can talk about, you know, the catalyst for this, but is the price of a lot of things is going up and they're calling it inflation. We could talk about what it is and how high it's going up and when it's going to go back down and why those things matter. But the argument, of course, Christian, is Joe Biden came in, everything's more expensive, and your taxes are also going up. And it's just so they can take that money and give it to poor people or black people or whatever you want to say. And it's believable. That's a believable argument. Think prices are going up on a lot of things. There are shortages of a lot of things for different reasons. Uh, there is some inflation. And uh, Chipotle did announce that they were going to raise their prices 36 cents a burrito or something like that. That argument is one that I think is effective and I worry about it. What do you think of the prices of things going up and whether or not that matters? And are you changing? Are you not going to uh, go to Chipotle anymore? <laughs> um, I mean, you know, your, your price argument is true. I, I, I may I may look at things in too philosophical and broad a way. Both whereas, things are true about what you said. No, hold on. You, yeah. Yeah. But you're right. You're talking about more bread and butter tactile things which i guess is what moves people uh, at the margins I, I i it's bizarre to me but but i know i i guess i understand that and i don't think i understand that a lot of the quote-unquote shortages that are going on are still an issue uh are still attributable to the pandemic in a lot of ways supply lines and whatnot and i'm hopeful that some of that will get alleviated soon i i know nothing about it i'm not an expert but I, I'm hoping that that is a sort of temporary situation. As far as Chipotle goes, I'm, what, who I'm really mad at is the just media for basically just publishing Chipotle's bullshit as if it was, you know, uh, at face value. Chipotle says, we're raising prices because we have to pay people more. And everyone, and everyone in the media just publishes that as fact. Wh who, who, what are you basing that? If you're a newspaper, if you're a news outlet, what are you basing that relationship on other than Chipotle saying so? You know, it's a, this is the thing that corporations do all the time. Every time they're forced to pay people more, they, they raise prices and they say it's, well, it's because it's because of all these liberal things that got passed. Mm -hmm. And then news outlets just publish that at face value as if there's any scientific proof that that's true. Uh, who says that Chipotle has to have the same growth margins that it's all, you, you know what I mean? Like, like, yeah. Why does the CEO have to get paid as much as the CEO, CEO got paid last year? And obviously I understand one person's pay is not going to 
you know, a uh, company as large as McDonald's, which owns no, but that's that's not necessarily. It's not just one person's pay. The CEO's pay reflects the whole C-suite executives. You know, yes. it reflects all of the executives, the hierarchy, and so yeah. I. Think, God I think, forbid we take less. So if yeah. if we have to pay people more, we're passing that, those those uh, prices on to the consumer, and we're presenting it as if this was completely out of our control, and and then newspapers will just print that as if it's true. There are, as if it's automatically like there's no other way it could be. This is the way it has to be. Yeah. And that that enrages me. Is there a food product or 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 any product that off the top of your head you can think, you know, I don't I don't go to Chick-fil-A or I don't go to this place or that place because of a, a judgment or a thing that they've done. Like Home Depot is owned by a big Trump supporter, but I still go there. Like I, there's not too many that I really wholeheartedly ban, but a lot of listeners are very principled and and don't even like shop at Amazon and, and all kinds of different things. Do you have any, do you have any of that? Is there any like company that you just wholeheartedly like, I just can't, I can't give them my money ever. Well, it's, it's, you know, it's a recipe for being a hypocrite because, you know, yeah. we all have to yeah. exist in yeah. society. Yeah. Right. And, you know, you could go to Lowe's instead of Home Depot, but there it's isn't a Lowe's. Eight miles further, I'm burning more gas. It's not yeah, worth yes. it. <laughs> yeah, and there is no Lowe's near a me. There's a Home Depot there. down the street. Yeah, okay. you know, I, I think it's a good thing to remember. You know, when you're buying something off Amazon, it's like, why not take the extra step and buy it directly from uh, a small retailer? You know, if you can do that. Every once in a while, you're only going to find it on Amazon and you have to buy it on Amazon. But, you know, that's just the way that we all exist in the world. I think it's always important to remember. I mean, sometimes there's a direct one to one relationship where it's very easy to avoid a company like I'm not going to be buying a MyPillow anytime soon. Oh, you know, that is um, I'm sorry. Yeah, that that is print. That is a principled stand. I, mean, I did buy one once. You did, I had one because I had to do I did live reads at Syria. Yeah. Because how would you have known? I mean, I, I have a real sleep and it's real labor for me to you, find you cut, you, cut out, you cut out for a second. You have a what? Oh, I, I have a terrible time sleeping. I always have. And uh, and I've never been able to find a great pillow that works for me. And so I was like, I, I'll try it. It turns out it's the worst of all the pillows I've ever had. So it's it's easy for me to take that principle stand because those pillows suck. Um, but that even if they did... Yeah, well, okay. did you see the um, video that he, that he did for the my pillow? No, I have not. I've not seen that yet. Uh, I, I was sure you had, which is why I said it. But oh, it, I'm it, so it, sorry because I was sure you'd have a rant about how far how far he's fallen from America's mayor to hawking the my pillow, and it's more than just the pillow. He made a whole like video for uh, Mike oh, Lindell, well. which is um, what was the final thing I was going to ask you to to comment on here at the end? Uh, it was about oh Jeff Bezos mentioned. Speaking of Amazon. Uh, he's going to space uh, and we learned this this week. He's bringing his brother with him, I guess for like 11 minutes. Well, Good. What is- Go ahead. You know, whatever, uh, you know, it's like if he and Elon Musk are going to have this weird, you know, rivalry, I guess I'm sure that this has happened throughout history. I'm sure JP Morgan and, you know, the Astor family or whoever, whoever the rival uh, Titans of industry were at the time would have these little pissing contests Sure. Go ahead. Go, go, go to space. But then don't tell me that you can't afford to pay your employees or to give them breaks. They don't have to piss yeah. in bottles. You know, <laughs> you, you can't have you can't claim both things at once that this well, the is the Irish only way our business runs. A model because he's on a rocket ship. Yeah. Haven't. There you go. See, full circle. He's gonna but at least he gets to be in space. Yeah, because you you mentioned it's Bezos and Elon Musk, and then who's the other guy, the billionaire from Virgin? He apparently is thinking about now trying Richard to Branson. Richard Branson, I saw, said he's now going to go July fourth to try to beat Bezos. And then I, my question is, who are we? A, <laughs> all right, no, I do have one more. The magnetism thing. Did you see that this week with the vaccines? And the I did, I did. So, so then I read this whole thread from this responsible, thoughtful woman who seems respectable and smart about we can't call these people dumb. We have mm-hmm. to meet them where they are to try to convince them as, as, as much as it may anger you and you may want to call them dumb. And, I, and then I want to be like, OK, fine. But but some people are dumb and we do have to use that word sometimes or you're dumb about a lot of things. I don't know. What do you think about that? I, I don't think they're dumb. I just think they're liars. I think they're willfully obtuse that they are. Uh, they're. Deacon, they're they're 
starting with a conclusion and then they're creating a rationale for reaching that conclusion. And the conclusion is, is just that they don't want to take the vaccine. And to me, and this is, we've had this discussion before. I have sort of a grand theory of things that everything is all about personal branding and about, uh, uh, telling off people on their Facebook walls. And, uh, and they've constructed this image of themselves that they are against a certain group of people. And that certain group of people supports vaccines and so for the same reason, they didn't want to wear masks. They don't want to take the vaccine. And then they have to sort of uh, reconstruct some um, rationale to support that worldview because they've been broadcasting this image of who they are and things that they believe in for years now. And God forbid they ever say, hey, turns out I was wrong. And that's why it's very easy for them to change rationales about the vaccine. First, it's that it wasn't safe. Then it was that it wasn't going to work. And now it's this magnetism bullshit. And they don't, it's not difficult to just jump on whatever new rationale because the rationale doesn't matter. The point is, is that I am against you. I am against the people who are into vaccines and I will embrace any mindset that allows me to get to that end point. Um, so I don't think that they're dumb. I just think that they're full of shit. And to me, the, the way to deal with those people and it, it, maybe I'm wrong. I mean, I'm not an expert is for there to be consequences. That's the only thing. And it doesn't have to be like angry. It doesn't have to be punishment. It just has to be, oh, you're, you don't have a vaccine. You can't do these things. You can't do these things. We're only allowing vaccinated people to do these things. And they'll bitch and they'll moan. That's why you saw people lose their minds at the idea of vaccine passports. Even though you've had to show vaccination papers to do things throughout the history of this country. You know, you've had to show, uh, you've had your shots. People don't understand that like, your shots were vaccinations. Like, oh, have you had your shots? These are the things that people just took for granted for decades and decades. I'm late to getting to you because I had to take my daughters to get their physicals so they could go to camp. Yeah. They had to go to the doctor to get physicals and get a stamp on a yes. piece of paper to give to the camp. I never, I didn't, my wife told me they need to, they need to update their physicals. They need them anyway. I was like, okay. And that was, like, there's no, I'm not, no one's controlling me. That's what they yeah. need to go to camp, to go to school, to play a sport. Yeah. And so to me, it's like, I don't believe in just calling people stupid just because it feels good. I don't even, even though I think they're full of shit, I don't even know that it's worth calling, telling them they're full of shit. Like, I don't even know that any of it's worth it. The only thing in my mind that will fix it is just for the price of being unvaccinated to overwhelm their attempts at personal branding. This is a free country. Can't tell me what to do. Well, then I, you can't tell me what to do. And what I'm saying is that you can't come in my fucking store <laughs> or, you know, you can't attend my concert or. What did you think of uh, the guy slapping the French press? <laughs> slapped I, the shit out of Macron. Yeah, dude slapped uh, Macron. And, um, what's his first name? Is it? I always forget. I'm going to say I was Francois. going to say Francois, but is, is that just me just picking the most French name I can think of? <laughs> I refuse to look it up. These listeners are yelling it right now. But. I know. It's really sad. Emmanuel. Emmanuel Macron. That's there you go. Well done. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I pulled it out of my butt. I, mean, uh, I like it when countries embrace their cultural stereotypes. It, it really <laughs> saves us time as comedians. Like, oh, did you hear what happened to Macron? What, did somebody limply slap him and then dramatically yell a political <laughs> slogan? Yeah. Uh, assassinate your leaders or or else i mean don't, don't. I, I feel like the the only thing that would have made him more french is if he'd slapped him with a baguette <laughs> and a, a beret <laughs> yeah and I, I it's funny because if you see he sort of pulled his punch slightly as he slapped him he sort of pulled which i attribute to the heavy influence of mime culture <laughs> today a french man wearing a beret and face makeup slapped the french president with a loaf of bread and then smoked a cigarette and then slinked away in black and white. Finnegan Friday is Christian Finnegan. Thank you very much, sir. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me, pal. All right. There he goes. Christian Finnegan. I pressed stop, but then he said this and I was still recording. So I'm going to keep it in. Uh, where are you going this weekend? 17 men from my high school graduating class. Where are you going? In house in the Poconos for three nights. All right. Going to oil up. New little Greco Roman homo eroticism and the jokes have been just nonstop. And there's <laughs> just so much talk about people's penises. And it was the biggest one. And it's mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
Uh, well, uh, I, I, I've heard that uh, jizz comes out of your beard really easily with the uh, Johnson Johnson baby shampoo. I'm sleeping in my car with the doors locked. Okay. Get <laughs> All right. See? Always funny. There you go. A lot of jokes about getting together with the boys, and you can send them all my way, because I love it. Very funny. I'm looking forward to it. But not before I share my conversation with Dr. Jason Johnson with you. Jason Johnson back on the program for the first time in months because he couldn't do other podcasts because he now has his own podcast where he just had a great conversation with Dave and Alan Greer and just look it up anywhere you find podcasts. Jason Johnson slate. It's called a word with Jason Johnson. He has been doing a great job over there, but I'm so glad to have him back over here with us because he was always uh, a listener favorite. Certainly one of my all time favorites. You can see him also, of course, all the time on MSNBC where he's a political contributor. He's a professor. Uh, at Morgan State University and just a, a brilliant guy who I love to talk to. We covered a lot of ground. It's been way too long. And so here we go on Twitter, by the way, he's also great at DR Jason Johnson. Our conversation starts right when he punched in to our, the video link and I saw him and I was just all so excited it was happening. Here we go. Yay! <laughs> Yeah, I, I, hit, I hit record. I hit record because I, I know. Like, so I know we're just like talking. We always start the show with just like freestyle anyway. So I'm very happy to be like, I've just so the audience says, I've talked to Pete, but I haven't been on with Pete. So I'm excited. Yes, we have. Con- yes, I, we have become uh, very good friends and we talk sometimes for hours like on Dude, Christmas like, Eve. Last time we talked, it was like it was like one something in the morning in L.A. Like, like we were like talking about comedians and I'm driving around downtown because the conversation I, was so compelling. I didn't want to go home. I legit <laughs> canceled the uh, the opening of the show because of that conversation that night. I was like, ah, forget the news. I'm just going to keep talking. I loved it. <laughs> so now you're available. Let's not even get into why you're doing a great podcast on Slate. You weren't allowed, but now you're allowed. Who cares? Yes, I'm yes, so psyched yes. to have you back on the podcast. We've obviously been talking a lot off, but it's I really, really missed having your voice on on this program just because of the way that we've gotten so close. And I feel like I can say anything and ask anything. And we always have all the great, offensive shit. Yes. Yeah. All the, <laughs> all the deeply horrific stereotypes and generalizations. Speaking of black men. <laughs> Let's talk about Hunter Biden. Those text messages. Let's talk about that. Hey, I read that last night. Yeah. Read that last night. In case people don't, yeah. in case people don't know, I don't know how to summarize that quickly. But text messages between Hunter Biden and his lawyer, where he kind of jokingly refers to him as his N word, right? Yeah, like hard of, R. Oh, were there? <laughs> no, no, it was it was the A. It wasn't the hard R. Yes, I'm kidding. I think that I'm kidding. matters. It does. It really does. It's, it's it kind of, you know, like, so I'll, I'll tell you this internally. So the audience understand. So like these text messages come out and apparently Hunter Biden is using the N word back and forth with like a black lawyer and some friends and everything else like that. I mean, the larger issue, of course, is like, who the hell cares? Hunter Biden's not in government. This is just crazy right wing thing. But the other thing is like, you know, it, amongst amongst other sort of black people and friends of mine, it's like, the biggest problem is who's the black dude who lets his white friend use that language? Like that's a line in the sand. You don't do that. Oh, I'm like, sorry. That's, I, wait, the guy you was talking to is a black person. That's my understanding. Oh yeah. That's a game. That's a complete <laughs> game changer. Because what I was going to say is like, what's that country music star who was like, got in trouble and sold more albums as a result. Cause he was drunk and it caught on video. He's like, good night, my N words and all that, whatever. <laughs> But like now, oh, yeah. now there's I don't know if you heard about this, but there's a very well known comedy industry gatekeeper at the Just for Laughs Comedy Festival who just got mm-hmm. out of it. His name is Jeff Singer. I've always been pretty good friends with him. He brought me into the Just for Laughs Comedy Festival years ago. And he just got basically he had just resign from Just for Laughs because he was sitting around the table with some comedians the other night using the N word and somebody outed him. And so uh, my daughter's my daughter knows like young white kids who use that word in her school. Right. I've heard them. I was like, what is so what are the rules? Where are we? What are, what's happening? And why are so, white people using this word casually to their white friends and apparently even some of their black friends? Who are these people? So I, I, I don't know who these people are because they're not my friends. 
Uh, I, don't, I don't mess with people like that. And here's here's the thing. I always say this when we talk about like the, the N-word slurs, whatever. White people never, I mean, to, to quote Paul Mooney, white people never stopped using the N-word. Like, they never stopped. So the, what we're hearing, what's happening now is that using the term in public discourse has been verboten for, you know, 30 or 40 years. You can't just out and scream that at somebody even before we had many computers in our pockets and cell phone cameras. But as far as my personal experience, like there's just terms I don't use. Now I will say, and I, I've said this repeatedly and I always have this on record in case anybody tries to cancel me. There's all sorts of incredibly offensive terminology. I use when I'm talking to somebody at a non-professional sense. I sometimes do it because I think it's funny. I sometimes do it because it's the first word that comes to mind. I sometimes, I mean, like every single slur known to man, I have probably used it casually on the phone with somebody. How these some ever. There are certain slurs I don't use if I'm talking to those particular people, because no matter how close we are, I still think it's sort of dehumanizing. So, you know, like, and, and now mind you, also slurs only have a certain amount of meaning depending on who you are, right? Like, you can call a white person a cracker, but I don't, that doesn't have the same resonance as, as, you know, it's, uh, no, the, there's the nothing. There's, or something. There, let me just speak for the whites here for a moment. <laughs> There's nothing you can say to me, you or anybody, that's about an immutable characteristic about mine that hurts me in any way. Nothing. Right. Yeah. I mean, and but, but I'll, there's, I'll, no, there's no, because there's no, no, there's nothing attached to it. Doesn't it doesn't really affect me? Uh, you, there's a lot of things you could say to hurt my feelings and be very specific, but not like a, you know, something about being bald. In my case, I guess that's an immutable right. character. Go ahead. That's fine. But being white or being a man or being straight, like there's nothing that holds me back. I'm still winning. So you can't, those words don't hurt me because I'm, I'm still winning and the opportunity I, lane. And I think for me, if somebody calls me the N word and the last time that happened was two weeks ago, Where? um, <laughs> an email, the oh, guy just oh, randomly oh, after random. I was on TV, just emailed me at work and just had the N word like over and over again. It happens pretty regularly. Did you get um, back to, did you get back to him? I, you know, sometimes I send, I forward the emails to their jobs. <laughs> sometimes, yeah. Do sometimes that, do, I. Hmm. You got to be real stupid to use your work email. Yo, Don't they always come think? up with burner emails to 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 use the N word? All my N word <laughs> emails are burner emails. <laughs> right, exactly. I use my other account when I decide to be anti-trans and anti-Semitic. I have a whole burner account for all of my offensive terminology. With a, um, with a picture of Geraldo. I think that's not fair. I think that's not fair. Exactly. The shirtless exactly. One. I just I just list my colleagues and, and throw them out there. I was like, oh my God, is that happening to you? Who did that? Who broke into <laughs> your Twitter? Um but but my sort of thing with it also is if somebody calls me the N-word. I am less concerned about the content of the word, right? Because you can't do anything to me. I'm more bothered by the, what it suggests that you're willing to do, right? Like if you're willing to call me the N word in public, in a public space, that means that the usual social norms of how you interact are gone. And you might then also engage in violence, right? Like the person, like the person who's screaming in line at the grocery store, you don't necessarily care about the screaming. You're like, wait, they don't care what anyone else thinks. So they can do anything. That's how I respond to somebody actually using the N word. And again, I think in person, it's been a minute since I heard someone actually say that to me in person. Um, although close, close in the Iowa caucuses about five years ago, um, you know, Trump, you know, the term Trump was used as sort of a threat to black people. And I had several white boys drive by me and scream Trump at me, which is basically like, <laughs> I'm going to kill you. Same thing yeah. as the N word. There's a lot now that has replaced it. Well, mm. l l I want to move on from it because it's super important. But d just real quick on the, Bi on, the, on the Hunter Biden thing, like, what do you think? Does it where we go with that? And what, is, what does it mean when or why does it matter when Sean Hannity's making a big deal out of this on his show or when the right someone on the right is is calling him out because i feel like that's there's a double standard there that you know words mean one thing policy means another thing regardless regardless of what we're talking about well yeah it's it's all it's all in bad faith I call mean, me an n-word all, all you want don't take my vote don't take yeah yeah I, I don't care and and it's it's all in bad faith because goodness gracious if we were to keep, compare hunter biden's even use of language the things we've heard that ivanka trump used to say 
uh, things that we heard that Jared might have. Ent- I mean, like it ain't it ain't like Don and and the rest of Trump's children weren't engaging in all sorts of verbal val- malfeasance as well. So I, I don't. That's one thing that makes it sort of bad faith. But the other thing is, you know, when you have these hard right people uh, who and, and by hard right or hard right affiliated, I mean, everybody from Sean Hannity to uh, uh, to Tucker Carlson, to these sort of boomerang left people who who acquiesce to their nonsense now. I mean, they're always coming up with excuses for people using that kind of language. But the moment that somebody supposedly liberal, I mean, I don't even know what Hunter Biden's politics are, honestly, because the man wasn't running for office. I mean, he, he could be he could be a, a, a non-voting centrist for all I know. So what some random 50 year old white guy says in text messages to his friends means nothing to me. And the people who want to report on it are showing that they're just sort of bad faith actors grasping at straws so that they can justify actual night, white nationalists who are trying to take over the country. I think it's worth reporting. I know I'm not that. <laughs> I'm not it's that. entertaining. I mean, it's it's entertaining. It's really weird, but it ain't like it ain't moving me. Guy's weird. You guys had a had a strange life, and he's a strange fella, and has had a interesting struggle. Um, you, I want to ask you about Joe Biden's visit to Tulsa last week because you made a lot mm-hmm. of waves with your commentary on MSNBC, where you mm-hmm. basically said, you know, it's it's very nuanced. I don't want to minimize it. And uh, but you, you said, obviously, you believe that Joe Biden cares about the victims of Tulsa. He went there to highlight what happened. Most people have no idea about the Tulsa massacre, but wasn't nearly far enough. And right. you were even more cynical in terms of uh, folks being kind of used as 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 props in, in a way. Why is Joe Biden not enough for you? Why are you so critical of him here? Because I might. And what was the reaction? Greatest... I'm really interested in hearing what the, oh, not, the, oh, not, the not the unacceptable, ridiculous reaction, but the thoughtful. I know that you think yeah. reasonable people can disagree to some extent on this. So, yeah, the whole yeah. thing. Yeah. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll start with Biden, then I'll go to reactions. The thing about Biden is my greatest fear about him always has been that he does not recognize the urgency of the moment, that he thinks he can work with people who are not interested in working with him, that he thinks that being a good and decent man, that he can create an environment when, in fact, you're dealing with people who, like, want to overthrow the government. They don't just disagree with you. They don't even they don't even think your party or your existence is legitimate. And I don't think Joe Biden always recognizes that it trickles down to ways that he deals with particular constituents. So, for example, you go to Tulsa, right? We give so much money to victims of natural disasters in this country, right? Pe- people who, who suffered, and I'm not saying those people shouldn't get money. Uh, Hurricane Katrina, a hurricane this, hurricane that. This country hands out money all the time to people who have been victims of natural disasters, violence. We gave out money last year for PPEs and everything else like that during the pandemic. We, Tom Brady got cash. So everybody can get cash. <laughs> but these people... There's only three of them left. They're over 100 years old. You're acknowledging that they were the victims of vigilante violence and state violence and insurance companies that for nothing other than racism refuse to acknowledge their claims. But you got nothing for them. Like like a 100 year old person does not need a low interest loan on a new home. Okay, cut them a check. And and this will lead into sort of people's criticisms of it. I believe. And the creativity of the American government, when the American government wants to get something done, we can do it. And money ain't that hard to come by. You could have had a grant with the the National Education Association, Department of Education, Historical Society, whatever, and said we have a public-private grant uh, to make an oral history of these experiences, and that grant is going to be a million dollars to this woman. This Like, we could have come up with the money. And that's where I think Biden consistently comes up short. He thinks that making these symbolic gestures, whether it's for bipartisanship, whether it's for infrastructure, whether it's for talking to both sides, is going to change this country. And we're past that. Cut people checks and get stuff done. So that that was the core of my criticism. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. I think that's, So you would have been, not, I'm not going to say satisfied, but you thought it would, it would have been at least something to give the... Some remaining survivors that are like 150 years old. Something. Yeah. 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 Like, like, dude, Pete, they're not going to be around for the 120th anniversary. 
They may not even be around for the 105th they anniversary. They might be gone now. I mean, when you're 107, what? I think you're kind of like, if, if any, if I have, I just always be like, am I here? How about now? How about now? <laughs> but so, yeah, no, there's, there's a lot that we can obviously talk about uh, more with that. I want to get to a few more things for, I know I got to let you go. I'm so excited to be talking to you on the record here again, but so I want to I talk about the responses though. You, you, oh yeah, you sorry, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, what was yeah. The, yeah so, please. So what were the reactions? Here's, here's, the thing about, here's the thing about the reaction. So, you know, and we're, we're good for it. We talked about this on and off, but dude, like when I get text messages that say you're trending, I'm like, ah, oh, shit. Like, 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 I got a text message from 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 a friend of mine uh, who is a professor. She's like, hey, you're trending on Twitter. And I was like, for what? What did I do this time? And so I saw that I was trending uh, based on what I said. And, and shout out. And I always say this. I, I, I'm a huge fan. I have great colleagues at MSNBC. I always thank Nicole Wallace for creating the kind of environment on Deadline White House where people can speak and have honest, sincere conversation. And I actually think I was like, hey, thanks for letting me sort of say that. And she's like, no, no, you're great. Uh, the people who were thoughtfully in disagreement were like, you're expecting too much. The fact that he's the only guy to go do this and you're just bypassing that mm. in order to complain. That is the primary criticism. You didn't bypass, that people you didn't, you didn't bypass it. I just want to be clear. Like, that's why I said about you want nuanced. You you gave him credit for going. You, yeah. And that's, that's, and that's, that's not the enough. thing. So, so when people are saying like, you're, you're, you're stealing joy. Cause it's similar to the, I, I had some people criticize me with my response to the, the Derek Chauvin ruling and, and finding him guilty. I was like, okay, that doesn't bring anybody back. That really didn't keep Makia Bryant from being killed. Like I'm not really interested in the symbolic stuff if it doesn't necessarily end up changing people's lives. So that's what the critique was. But I'll also say this, and this is, this is the core of it. One of my favorite memes um, is, is Hannibal Burris from uh, the Eric Andre show, the, the, the little gif where it's like, why are you booing? I'm right. Um, <laughs> I, just love, love, I just love to put that out on Twitter yeah. because it's like, look, y'all, it, it, and this, it, the part that always bothers me is when it comes from black people. The vast majority of black folks will say, yes, thank you, blah, blah, blah. I, had a, I was in Atlanta on Monday. I had a woman literally walk up to me and hand me a note. I was out at dinner with a friend of mine and was like, I just want to thank you for what you do. Like, most people were nice. Uh. But black people seem to occasionally have this this belief, some, not all, that we can't be as demanding of our politicians as other people can be. And that if we ask for too much, we'll somehow be rejected or smacked down. And it's like, you know, hmm. if, 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 if you go to the memorial for World War II veterans, of which we only have a less than, I think, 100,000 left World War II actual veterans left, men and women in this country. If you go to a World War II memorial and, and, and you don't also say, in addition to honoring this greatest generation, we're sending additional funding to the local veterans hospital. People are like, how are you going to leave? You didn't bring anything? You know, so why is it black people are supposed to just be happy with crumbs when our government has yeah. been able to cut checks for everybody else and 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 not for everything, but just three people? It's funny because I, I will often be paying attention to the news or a policy or something somebody says, and I'll be satisfied with it. And then I'll see you go, no. And I'll go, oh, yeah, no, OK. All right. So it's not enough. Not enough. Like I and I think that that's the role that you and, and several others are playing in, in right now in media. I'm talking mm -hmm. about media. And by the way, there is mm -hmm. this kind of like if people pay close attention from Twitter to the TV, there is this kind of group uh, of, of people who are clearly very close friends. You, Ali Mistal, <laughs> Tiffany Cross, Chrissy Greer, yep. obviously Joy Reid, yep. who seems to be the the kind of the, the, the Don of it all. Yes. Um, and that she's, yes. <laughs> she's opened the door for a lot of you at specifically at MSNBC and with TV, at, it would seem. Mm -hmm. But and I maybe there's some few other names, but they're, you know, holding a standard, which is super helpful for someone like me, because I'm not going to lead on this, but I am going to right. react to things often. And my reaction is often, oh, that's that's great. That's really good. And then mm -hmm. I'll hear you or read you. I'm like, oh, okay, all right. So it wasn't good enough. And this this is what should be done. And that's the impression that I get in the role that you're playing. And I think it's a really important one. I don't have a question. I think that was more of a statement. If anything, you want to add to that mafia well, that you're and, in. And I want to add, you know, and, and one sort of important thing about this, uh, and I, I said this in all sort of sincerity and all humility, is that 
you know, yeah, like a lot of us know each other. We're, we're in text groups. We talk all the time. And I, 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 like I said, I have a similar thing, like some legal thing will come out. And I'm like, is this good? And then I'll read Ellie. I'm like, no, it's wrong. Right. right. Like that, because <laughs> I'm not a lawyer. So right. I learned things from other people. Yeah. But I will also say this. I think when the criticism comes through, even, you know, the, the, not the sort of unreasonable, blah, 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 bad face sort of criticism. But one other thing that I don't think people always understand is that like, this stuff ain't coordinated. Like you, like I said, you and I talk like this is actually what I think. And I'm, I am often surprised when the public has that kind of reaction to it because people are like, you're just trying to, I was like, no, I'm not being contrarian. This is actually just how I think. I, I'm surprised nobody else thought this. And then you find out that lots of other people do. And sometimes people just have a reaction to how you say things as opposed to, and even like you said, it was pretty darn nuanced, but you know, some people are going to have fits regardless. So I want to I want to throw this out to you. Speaking of Ellie Mistal, he's uh, been just on fire for well yes. a couple of years now, really. But I yeah. mean, <laughs> thank goodness for him in, in a lot of ways. He's such a unique guy. And mm-hmm. writing at the Nation magazine when when talking about the, it was the article a couple of columns ago about Merrick Garland being an institutionalist, and he included yeah. a quote from Dr. King, which I wanted to to read to you and, and have you. Help me understand what this means in today's context, because I've heard this before, but uh, I think it's super important. He included in this column where uh, Dr. King from Birmingham jail, I guess is from a uh, part of letter from he writes, mm-hmm. I must confess that over the past few years, I've been gravely disappointed with the white moderate. I have almost reached the regrettable conclusion that the Negro's great t- stumbling block in the stride toward freedom is not the white citizens counselor or the Ku Klux Klanner. But the white moderate, who is more devoted to order than to justice, who prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of tension, to a positive peace, which is the presence of justice. Lukewarm acceptance is much more bewildering than outright rejection. What was he talking about then, and how does it apply to now? Well, one, as you can see, uh, MLK is allowed to use the N-word, the other one, because, you know, (laughs) he freed us us from so many other things. (laughs) <laughs> Should I have not read, read that? Cl- you read the cleaned up version. Um, oh, so, did he not? Did he not use that that in the real? He, he, I was. I'm just kidding. I'm, oh, he said I know. Negro. I see what you're saying. I'm say. sorry. I want to edit that all out. Of course, he didn't use. Of course, he didn't use that. In the I'm like, what are you talking about? What's happening? Go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> That's the unedited king. Um, so yeah, <laughs> but, but basically, what he's talking about is the idea that you have a lot of white people. Um, who are ostensibly in favor of a more egalitarian society, but who um, who prioritize, you know, uh, an unjust peace over, you know, disruption and chaos that may lead to equitable change. And so what you have are, quote unquote, moderates or centrists. We see this right now with Joe Manchin. And I don't really think Joe Manchin's a centrist. He's pretty conservative, but he's more concerned with this theoretical idea of bipartisanship, regardless of how impractical it seems in the real world, than he is with the fact that you have one particular party that is literally trying to make it impossible for whole sections of people to vote. You have folks now who get concerned about, you know, the tone of the White House or or we've got to work with different kinds of people, people who are, in fact, saying, I want you dead. And that's what King was talking about with the white moderate, the person who was like, I just want everybody to get along. And like, no, you can't always get justice by having people get along. You can't get along with a Republican Party that as of right now, as of right now, is in favor of a violent overthrow of the government. Like, I, you, there's no other way around this. There is no version of the Republican Party that's not saying it's perfectly okay to overthrow the government. You know, and like, hey, I, I, unless I got this wrong, like, and I'm still friends with Michael Steele. I'm like, I don't understand how you can be a Republican still. These people tried to overthrow the government, and then they voted to not investigate it. Like, it doesn't get any worse than that. So that's what we're talking about. Anybody who wants to work with or find common ground with a party that's very policy is about dehumanizing a large swath of the American population. That, that's what King is warning us about. And we're not we're 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 not in a good place. We're not in a good place. And I, I don't think I don't think yeah. leadership understands. I don't think Joe Biden. I don't think Vice President Harris really understand how bad a situation we're in right now, how much worse it's going to get. How would you describe that the the place that we're in that's not good? What are you referring to in terms of the the the, the Republican Party and the and the view? What are you saying? I'm saying like 
so this is this is what's crazy right so if you had let's say you had like a neighbor right and 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 like you know your neighbor is like yeah you know i want you to 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 i don't know come to my family picnic or something else like that but like you walk by their house a week before the picnic is supposed to happen you saw this guy and his wife like fighting and screaming and throwing stuff at each other and 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 yelling at each other and throwing things out in the front yard and they're like yeah we're having a picnic on friday you'd be like i I think you guys have some stuff you need to work through. I don't know that now is the time to come over and do a picnic. And they're like, no, no, it's fine. It's fine. I don't even know what you're talking about. That's America right now. Like there's this whole report out this week that like a lot of other countries and Germany and, and, and France and everything else like that. They're like, dude, we like you Americans, but you literally had a, a an attempted coup in January and you haven't jailed anybody. We don't think your situation is all that stable. I don't know how you don't see this. So again, when that guy comes, you know, when that guy's walking around the neighborhood, I'm like, dude, you, you got a black eye and there's lipstick on your car that says, you know, I hate you. <laughs> and you're sitting here telling me we should come and barbecue on Friday. You need to clean up your own house. Our house is a mess. Our, our house is, 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 is teetering on the edge. And I don't think Joe Biden wakes up every day thinking, oh, yeah. People are out to kill me. That's what worries me because I wake up every day thinking like, oh, yeah, there's people like legit trying to overthrow this country and they're going to try again um, as soon as they think they have the opportunity. Mitch McConnell doesn't care about that because he thinks he'll be fine. But the rest of us should be concerned. Uh, Before I let you go, let's end on a high note. Your podcast has been great. Uh, Your last episode is with David Allen Greer, which... He's kind of like, dude, there's a lot of goats. There's a lot of goats, but yeah. I think, I think he's in many, I mean, I have a lot of thoughts about him and I know him a little bit and I just think I've, he's my favorite because he's so, uh, uh, approachable. Like he yeah. seems very kind of down to earth and, and thoughtful and real and always has been and and kind of his reputation and entertainment amongst anybody who's worked with him is like, yeah, he's. The, the coolest and the funniest and the, you know, the most generous. And you guys had a great interview, but uh, just a word about the podcast, about that interview and, and, and what you're trying to do over there with Slate. Yeah. So I'll tell you that I, I thanks for picking that up. Pete. Like my, my mom who says hi, cause I told her I was gonna be back on the show. Dr. Uh, Johnson. Yeah. She's got to come back on the show. Let's do the trio. Oh yeah. Oh, most yeah. definitely. Um, but my mom was like a huge fan of David Allen Greer going all the way back. She saw him in a soldier's play. Uh, and Chrissy was telling me how she had seen him in a soldier's play last year with our other friend, Niambi. Um, I, I am a big, big fan of, of his work in general. And I'll say this about what, what I'm doing at the podcast when I'm learning from people like you and other podcasts that I've been on. I like podcasts that make me feel like I'm sitting on a conversation with a bunch of guys in the car. Yeah. Like that's what I like. Yeah. I I don't, I don't need a sit down interview. I like being able to just sort of talk. And so that's what we're shooting for with these last couple. So we had, uh, um, uh, gosh, the, the Chidi from, uh, from a good place and then David Allen Greer. And then I just talked to Ibram Kendi, you know, who wrote how to be anti-racist. Yeah. Um, and it's just, it's just fun conversations with people that I actually would want to chat with. And, and that's what makes it sort of enjoyable. Like, you know, you have some podcasts that are like a, a rotation of friends, you know, Pete, it's, it's us talking. We're, we're friends. We just use slightly less profanity, um, you know, <laughs> and other podcasts are like, I've always wanted to talk to this person. It would be awesome if I could get them on a show. And yeah. that's what I've been able to do. So uh, it's, it's yeah. been cool. And I will tell, I, I will tell you, like, I, I met David, you talk about how down to earth he is. I met David because he was making fun of me on Twitter. And we just, what, what, I, I didn't what, know what was he, something you did on TV or something. No, no. So it was like, I, you know, I always go to retro news and I do these sort of oh, know, yeah, sports I love and culture. I, hot I actually, I actually enjoy that. Yeah. I say and actually, because so, when people sometimes go outside their lane, it's not that far outside your lane, but like yeah. when Wajad Ali tweets about basketball, when people tweet about sports that are, I'm like, no, no, but you, it's like, yeah, retro TV shows and stuff. You just yes. made me watch a, an old clip of ALF this morning in preparation to talk. Anyway. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Or, or like I said, Wajad and I will be like DMing and stuff about like Star Wars. So yeah. I, I didn't, uh, there was an old clip that I was playing on retro news about, um, uh, about Soul Train. 
And I didn't know who the singer was on Soul Train. And he starts making fun of me. He's like, how do you not know who Marilyn McCoo is? I was like, I don't know who that is. So it was like like a whole day of people making fun of me. And then like literally throwback 90s, Kathy Ireland tweeted me and said, how do you not know? Oh, that's know. hilarious for a billion year old reasons. me was like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. Kathy Ireland. Oh yeah, I had a poster of her. I, I had a, a huge yeah. poster. She was, yeah. <laughs> So, so he, <laughs> we just started laughing at each other after that. And he DM me, he's like, Hey, what's your phone number? Blah, blah, blah. So oh, yeah? yeah, he's just a really, really nice guy. We're going to, we're going to go to lunch when I head back to LA. He's filming something in Toronto right now, but I get back to LA next week and we're going to, we're going to grab lunch when he gets back. When you reached out to me last night and said, cause we talk all the time, but said, Hey, I can, yeah. I can do the podcast again. I was like in a bad little, just depressed last night I was in a bad mood. And uh, mm-hmm. I just, it just turned me right around. I'm so happy that you're able to do this again. And I know everybody else will be as well. Thank you for talking to me today, buddy. It's great to have awesome. you back on the show. All right, man. Talk to you later. All right. There he goes on Twitter at DR Jason Johnston. So great to have him back. So great to have Christian Finnegan. A great Friday episode, even though I didn't do the news like I don't on Fridays. But that uh, gives me a little bit of a break. I love doing it, but that's always a lot of work and we'll be back at it on monday so thank you very much for listening today or anytime you did during the week please tell your friends give a review on apple Podcasts, five stars sign up for a subscription right now patreon.com slash pete dominic time for me to head off for boys weekend and it's a lot of boys 17 of us from the class of 93 it's stang bang everybody my high school mascot was mustang call it stang bang a lot of homoerotic undertones, and so we will see what happens in terms of nudity or all-out gay uh, love. Looking forward to it and uh, seeing all these guys. Hopefully I come back alive. That's seriously what I'm most concerned about. There's going to be a lot of debauchery. Okay, that's it for me. Thank you very much to you for listening. And now it's time for the great John Carroll to take us out. He called me last night, by the way. We talked off the air for a while. So thoughtful, so smart, so brilliant, and so just a, just a great, great guy. Love John Carroll. And here he is. Take it away, Johnny. Begin, they had to stand up. All right, they had to stand up. We got to stand up. We got to look the devil square in the eye. We got to let him know it's his time to go and make it clear when all we hear is a lie. Of that experiment, if you stand up, stand all right, up. we got to speak up, we got to reach up and raise your voice in every way you know how. Don't be told up, you got to show up. Ain't no better time to do it but now. No need to pledge allegiance to no one and try to rise up, show up. To the voice inside And listen well and it'll tell you Not to run and hide It says stand up Stand up Stand up